Happy Thursday, everyone, and welcome to a very special edition of Richard Skipper Celebrates and Create a Chat with Dr. Judy Bloom. I'm very excited about today's show because we are going to be celebrating with four people who have kept the flame of Judy Garland very much alive. It was 54 years ago today that Judy Garland passed away. I was eight years old. I was living in Conway, South Carolina, and believe it or not, I was very much aware of who she was, thanks to the annual showings of The Wizard of Oz on TV. Well, I remember that day like it was yesterday. Uh, our cousin Patsy, uh, with her family, came for dinner that night. And when she got out of the car, the first thing that she said was that Dorothy had died. Well, I had a cousin uh, named Dorothy, and that's who I thought she meant. And then she said, no, I mean Judy Garland for The Wizard of Oz. And I thought that was impossible, because how could Judy Garland be dead? Dorothy from The Wizard of Oz, who we saw year after year after year. And when I turned on the TV, and of course it was wall-to-wall -wall coverage, I threw myself on the floor and I screamed, I can't go on, I can't go on. My mother, of course, pulled me aside and she says, you don't even know this woman. But at eight years old, something struck me about her. And it still strikes me to this day. So I'm very excited about today's show. All last year, for the entire month of June, I celebrated every single day Judy Garland with all these very special guests. And uh, I would like to open today's show with this very special montage that we put together for last year. And then you will see my other favorite Judy on the other side of this. So let me pull this up. Uh, just bear with me for one second. And here it is as we celebrate the one and only Judy Garland. Dear, when you smile at me, I heard a melody. It haunted me from the start. Something inside of me started a symphony sing went the strings of my heart was like a breath of spring I heard a robin sing about a nest set apart all nature seemed to be in perfect harmony sing went the strings of my your eyes made sky seem blue again What else could I do again But keep repeating Through and through I love you, love I still recall the thrill I guess I always will I hope we'll never depart But dear, with your lips to mine Divine Sing when the strings Of my I seem blue again What else could I do again But keep repeating Through and through I love you Love you I still recall a thrill I guess I always will I hope we'll never depart Dear, with your lips to mine Oh, perhaps a deed of
Can you imagine all of that in 47 years? Oh my God. And what really strikes me, she, she had so many different looks and, you know, per personas and, you know, just the, the evolution of her personality over all those years. And like you, I mean, I grew up watching, you know, Wizard of Oz. I mean, you know, that was, and it was Judy Garland, right? So, you know, I totally- Do you remember when she passed away? Yeah, of course I remember, yeah. Do you remember the details of that? I mean, that day is it's so vivid in my memory and I'm not making this up. I was eight years old and I'm screaming and, and that I can't go on. And my mom is shaking me saying, you didn't even know her. But, <laughs> <laughs> and that tells you everything you need to know about me, everyone. Exactly. <laughs> Our therapy session is over now. All right, so what do Carol Channing and Judy Garland have in common? What, what's, the, what's the thread for you? Really? They love to entertain. It was all about giving and giving and giving to the audience. And it's very interesting because today I was reading one of my guests that's been on the show is Jill Schweitzer, and she has an incredible book called The Contemporary Singer Songbook. She's down in Florida. And uh, one of the things that she, I was filling out a questionnaire today in her book, and it was asking for favorite entertainers. And uh, Judy Garland and Carol Channing, of course, both ended up on that list. But today we're going to be celebrating four very special people. They're all in the wings. I can see them all waiting. And we're going to bring them on, uh, you know, in alphabetical order, just so that we're all in an equal playing field, so that they know who will be coming on. But do you have a favorite Judy Garland film, by the way? Probably The Wizard of Oz, you know? I mean, the first w the, the, the first impression, you know, that was my first impression of her. So that's the one I think I held on to the most. And because when I saw it, I was probably roughly the age she was in the in the film. W was the first time I remember actually seeing the film. On wow! Top. Wow! So it was well, very you know, it's interesting. Early, you know, she had this incredible career at MGM, but the very last movie that she made at MGM was Summer Stock. And there is an amazing new book that's going to be coming out uh, in October, I believe it is, unless uh, everyone can get it on pre-order. Uh, but this book is coming out in October, and both of the authors are here today. But before we bring them on, let's take a little look at the original trailer from Summerstock. Say it's an almost perfect paradise. There are many reasons 
why you should rejoice. You, you can, can make, make the pleasure that's around you. Like an endless dream is coming true. And of what you've got to find is quite a lot. You're wealthy indeed. With the gold in your purse. Cause the whole universe is all for you. How could MGM let that go? <laughs> David Benjamin, Tom Johnson, uh, uh, welcome to the show. I am thrilled that you're both here. Uh, first of all, I love that poster of That's Entertainment uh, behind you. Uh, I want to ask, first of all, why a book about Summer Stock? And we're getting feedback here, so I'm just uh, I'm going to uh, do a why, why a book about Summer Stock? Well, I think it's pretty easy to tell why. First of all, it's interesting that they open with that iconic number, Get Happy, because Get Happy almost didn't happen. It was sort of an afterthought. But why Summerstock, I think, simply put, I think the Hollywood lore or the lore amongst a lot of film fans is that it was, yes, it was a troubled production. Yes, there was a six-month production window. But I think most people point to the cause as Judy Garland. And truth be told, after many years of research, Judy was only a small portion of why it took six months to complete that film. So we want to bust a lot of myths about Judy's role in that film. Now, let's put things into perspective. When that film was shot in late 49 and into 50, Judy was having an increased dependency on prescription meds. Her marriage to Vincent Minnelli, where all intents and purposes was over. She had a toddler, Liza, at home. So she was under a great deal of stress at the time. But the real reasons beyond some of Judy's issues were that when they went into production and they were in December of 1949, they realized that the songs written by Harry Warren and Matt Gordon were not sufficient to get them to the finish line. So Matt Gordon was no longer available for some reason. And so they had to bring in Jack Brooks and Saul Chaplin and Harry Warren. And guess what? They had to write You Wonderful You. They had to write some other songs that you saw in the trailer. And guess what? It takes time. You have to compose. You have to arrange. You have to orchestrate. You have to record. Those things take weeks. And then, of course, the myth about Get Happy and that it was shot for, it was from a different number, it was cut from another film, all baloney, all, as they say, malarkey. Um, Judy wrapped in mid-February and came back within a month and knocked off that Ted Kohler, Harold Ireland number, which became one of her most iconic in all of her film career. But the other thing that's amazing, and I think don't people don't realize, and it's not even in the trailer, Gene Kelly did that incredible solo on the proscenium stage with the squeaky board and the newspaper. Two things about that. One, it was Gene Kelly's all-time personal favorite solo number. And guess what? It was the last thing shot. It was shot after Get Happy. Oh, so, wow. yeah. So uh, there's just a lot of twists and turns. I think there's a lot of dramatic arcs in the story, as well as some comedic arcs. And maybe Tom can come on and talk about the camaraderie and the safety blanket that Judy had with director Chuck Walters and Eddie Bracken and Gene and all of those people. Well, yes, that's true. As Dave said, uh, they were there. All Chuck Walters, Gene Kelly, uh, Eddie Bracken, Phil Silvers, they were basically in the movie for a large reason to basically keep Judy sort of uh, together. They were the strong mm -hmm. shoulders of support that she needed to get through filming. And she had worked with Chuck before and totally trusted him. And even Lorna Luft, uh, Judy's daughter, told us that that Chuck was just a, a really close personal friend that she absolutely trusted. So she had the support network for her during this film. And even Gene said that, you know, he was really right at the beginning of, of breaking out. And American in Paris would be his next movie. It just made on the town singing in the rain was to come, but he said he would spend a whole year on summer stock. If that was what was required just to be there for Judy because he loved her and he wanted to support her. And he felt that he really owed her a lot because she was uh, 
you know, his mentor in the first film that uh, he ever made for me and my gal back in 1942. Mm -hmm. So all those, all those constituents came together to really get Judy through the filming of Summer Sky. Wow, it's amazing. I want to ask each of you, um, what was the biggest aha moment for each of you uh, in reading the book? And David, you can go first. Well, there's a lot of them. I think that um, how the story came about, the, the screenplay uh, by Cy Gomberg is an interesting story. I think there's something else that's really interesting. Everyone, when you talk about MGM musicals, we always talk about Arthur Freed, right? The number one producer of musicals. The number two producer of musicals was Joe Pasternak, who produced um, In the Good Old Summertime, Anchors Away, and of course, Summerstock. But he was known for all of these light, frothy, happy ending musicals. And the, what we did, we talked to his son, we talked to other people, including Connie Francis, who was in one of his later films. And what we unearthed is that Joe Pasternak lost his father, his sister, her six children, and about 40 relatives at Auschwitz. And if that didn't frame his psyche and his mentality. So we really take a deep dive into some of the people behind the scenes as well, including Chuck. The other thing that um, I think is a myth is that everyone says, oh, this was slotted to be a Mickey Rooney, Judy Garland. Let's put a show on in the barn reunion. Well, again, when we unearthed the facts, the Hollywood Reporter in December of 1948, that's a long time before the cameras rolled, almost a year, had Gene Kelly and Judy Garland attached to Summerstock from the get-go. Gene um, was attached to it from the get-go, and there was a few other women stars like June Allison that came and went um, for Judy. But again, it was a total myth. And yeah, there was some discussion about Mickey, but it wasn't very serious because he was never attached to the project. And Tom, I want to ask you, what was the biggest obstacle that you faced in writing this book, and how did you get through that obstacle? That's a really good question, Richard. I mean, we wrote this during the pandemic, and uh, you know, it was just exponentially harder to get, in some respects, to get to people. In some respects, it was actually easier. The the good thing about the only upside of the of the pandemic that both Dave and I can see is that people were willing to do Zoom calls because they had nothing to do. So some of the people, some of the stars that we interviewed for this, uh, very many people like Ben Vereen, Mikhail Bereshnikov, people like that, that gave us their, and Tommy Toon, just a, a litany of people that gave us their input were available for Zoom calls because they were basically twiddling their thumbs for two and a half years. So that was a good thing. But the bad thing was that a lot of the archives that we were relied on for, for you know, research were closed down and were had actually been shuttled off to warehouses and uh, like the Herrick Library, which which was helpful in, in many cases. A lot of that stuff they just couldn't access because there were the personnel weren't showing up. They weren't there. And the archives were were, you know, ripped off to some warehouse where they were just unobtainable for the duration of the pandemic. So so there were challenges and then little and upsides, too. But though that's kind of that was just the way it went for about three years of, of doing this. Well, thank God. And the book is finished and it's coming out. October. It's on pre-sale now, Amazon, the University Press of Mississippi. Um, but the last thing I also want to give kudos is our foreword was written by Tony Award-winning um, um, choreographer and dancer, Savion Glover. And Savion had never seen Summerstock until we introduced him to it. And then he wrote about his downloaded his thoughts. And he learned a lot about the history of dance um, from his idol, which was Gregory Hines and Fred Kelly, Gene Kelly's younger brother. Wow. I knew Fred, by the way. By the way, Very interesting. I met him when I first came to New York. I want to bring on our next guest. Um, we all love Judy. Uh, but this next uh, gentleman, uh, he has... Uh, for, uh, I, I guess, the past 11 years, and you're a little in the dark there. Uh, uh, oh, can you see me. it? Uh, yes. Uh, hi, Justin. Hi. Uh, Trying yeah. to help with lighting. Uh, you've there got a inner light, Justin. That's all that we need. Uh -huh. Yeah. So Justin has done an event uh, at Joe's Pub, 
uh, which is a major event. It's it's almost impossible to get tickets, but keep trying. Uh, and it's called the Night of a Thousand Judies. Um, Justin, how did this start? Uh, well, I had uh, thank you so much for having me. And what a wonderful book! I'm I'm very excited to get a copy for myself. All about summer stuff. Uh, uh, I had a long-standing show at Joe's Pub and a downtown variety show called The Meeting, which was a comedy variety show where every month we would celebrate a different gay icon and realizing that Judy was both born and died in June and June is Pride Month, we thought she would be the best icon to celebrate. Uh, we also wanted to end each of our seasons with a uh, uh, a charity event because the show was so much about community that we thought it would be a great way to give back to the community rather than uh, just kind of satisfy ourselves. So we teamed up with the Ali Forney Center, which uh, helps uh, housing for homeless LGBT kids in, the, in New York City and has become a model for such programs across the country. And we've been teamed up with them now for uh, ele all 11 years and made a, hopefully made a lot of money and helped them in, in their work. Um, hopefully yeah, you have made a lot of money for them. So Sure, sure. That's the plan, certainly. No, you've done very well with that. Are you surprised at how this has taken off the way it has? Because it's, an, it's a major event here in New York every year, and it's something that people look forward to every year. Oh, sure. I mean, I'm always very grateful that people come back every year and there's a lot of regulars that can kind of show up. And, and uh, we, we've been very fortunate in the fact that year after year, people always come and say, this was our favorite year. You had so many wonderful folks. And and uh, I I think that we, every year we really try to surpass ourselves. But I, I'm 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 surprised and not surprised. I'm surprised that I've I've been able to do something that's so marvelous. But I think that there is there's always a need uh, for people to get in touch with the music that this woman touched, what this woman meant to so many people as a star, as an icon. I think there's, you know, it's it goes back to the, that. I think there's a Mike Nichols quote where Mike Nichols said he saw only two great talents in his lifetime, and it was Brando and Judy Garland. That's right. You're absolutely and, right. Uh, and I think when you, she's so influential in so many ways. Um, but especially for people who, who want to sing and even touch this repertoire of songs that she introduced or, or, or put her own stamp on, uh, she becomes an, iconic, an iconoclast in that way for them and, and, and a way in which they're informed about the, their own instruments, their own artistry. And I think the, the, the show, rather than being some sort of imitation of what she was, is really... Uh, an homage to how she's touched each of the artists that come in and do the show, which I think is always exciting and, and a wonderful variety to kind of keep this music and keep that kind of artistry alive. Uh, I'm, I'm guessing, and I could be wrong, correct me if I'm wrong, that when you began doing this, it may have been mm -hmm. a little tougher the first time out to get some of these bigger names. Uh, but now I'm sure that they're coming to you saying that they want to be a part of it. Is it gotten easier for you? And are you surprised at uh, some of, I mean, you just had Molly Pope in the show, uh, show and uh, I mean, you just get amazing, amazing people. Yeah, I mean, I think it's always been, yeah, at first it was it was harder, but I think the, the, the what we wanted the show to be and what the show continues to be is, is a showcase for lots of different kinds of talents. So we always want new people that have never done the show and new people who are kind of coming up through the ranks of downtown where the show started out. And along with very established, you know, we've had Michael Feinstein and Martha Wash and Carol Lee Carmelo and all these incredible singers. So it, it, it's about, a, it's endlessly about a variety of performers. And, 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 and them putting their unique stamp on what Judy meant to them. So it's, it's always, it's, yes, it's become more easier because we have 11 years behind us and we can say, oh, this is what the show is, we know, you know. But I think we're always also on the hunt for who's someone new and exciting who's never gotten a chance to be at these venues or never gotten a, a chance to sing in this way, um, to highlight those artists because 
that's how I, I, I always feel like the show is about community and that's how you foster the show to continue on its own. Justin, that is the perfect segue for our next guest. Oh, marvelous. <laughs> yeah, I, can help. <laughs> I, I am putting you on the spot. You know, when I think of Judy, uh, Judy got us, uh, uh, got uh, people uh, through the Depression, through World War II. And, uh, you know, she's been such an icon for the gay community. She's gotten people through uh, the hard times and everything. Well, this next artist got so many people through the pandemic. Because when the pandemic began, she started in her car doing these incredible, uh, you, you know, clips. And it just, it, they went viral and it took over. I am such a fan of hers. She knows this because I have traveled great distances to see her. And uh, I'm going to show a little clip of her and then we'll bring her up on the other side. This is the amazing Debbie Wildman. Experience the 100th birthday celebration of the world's greatest entertainer, Judy Garland. Direct from London, internet sensation Debbie Wildman dazzles with songs that Judy would sing if she were with us today. From Adele to Lady Gaga, The Beatles and more. by the orchestrator of Jersey Boys. Don't miss this thrilling performance. You won't believe your ears when you hear it. Hello, Debbie. Hello. <laughs> Hi. Direct from London. What time is it there? Uh, half 11. Half at night. Well, God bless you for being here. So last year, Debbie, you know, and we'll talk about this because uh, talk about a trooper. Debbie uh, came, did a national tour here in the States for the first time. Uh, and she ending up culminating with a concert at Carnegie Hall. Mm -hmm. um, and she almost was not even able to get to the States uh, because, and I remember last year I had Debbie on the show to promote her coming to the States. And I had this ticker on the bottom of the screen of all of the cities that she was going to perform in. And Debbie called me and said, don't put the ticker on because I may not be able to make it because you had an issue with your passport. Yeah. Yeah. It was, um, getting the visa, I got the work visa and then they wouldn't send my passport back and I went to embassies and every, it was hideous, absolutely hideous. So Debbie, this has been, you know, we just culminated 100 years of Judy Garland. What, I mean, Carnegie Hall performing uh, as, uh, you know, singing uh, Have Yourself a Merry Little Christmas on stage with Margaret O'Brien, uh, appearing with some of the greatest names in show business. And I might say they're appearing with you. What, <laughs> I mean, how has this changed you in terms of, I know you're still a mom uh, for your wonderful little girl, uh, but how has this changed in terms of the way that you are looking at your career? Um, I don't know. It just seems like lovely little nuggets of stuff that I get to do that I never thought I'd be able to do. And I'm just enjoying it while I can because, you know, I, you never know what's going to happen. And I don't know. I, I hope lots more will come and it will be great. But I'm just trying to enjoy it as it happens, really, because... Um, you know, I'd tried and failed to become like singer, actress and that in my youth. I'm, I'm still young. Um, and I'd given that sort of dream up and I thought, oh, well, that's it. You know, got to earn money. I'll get a job. And I just really thought that that was it. I still always sang and stuff for fun. And then this all sort of came about in my mid to late 30s when I completely wasn't expecting it. And it's just like a lovely 
cherry on the cake really I don't know I, I don't really think of it in terms of a career to be honest I think of it as just really enjoyable stuff I get to do sometimes and I just try and enjoy it well, well, what was the inspiration for you when you decided to do Judy where did that come from originally um it was something I just found I I've always loved her from when I was a little girl it was my grandmother uh, we used to watch um there, I'm in the middle. We used to watch uh, all the classic Hollywood movies together. I was very close to my grandmother. I was an only grandchild and it would be our thing. And she showed me Easter Parade. That was my first Judy film. And I was just like, she's great. I was about six. And we used to watch all of her films together because my Nana had them all on video. And I found when I was about 11 or 12 that I could do a singing impression of Judy. I just sort of found that I could do it and did it for my grandmother, like, hey, listen to this. And then years later, when I was doing my degree at university, I did performing arts, um, they gave you the option at the end of your degree to either write a thesis or do a sh <laughs> let's put on a show. And obviously, I chose to put on a show. And I thought, well, what do I want to do? Like, I've got this opportunity to do anything I want. What would I want to do most? Ooh, I'd like to be Judy. Go Ooh, I could sing all those great songs. And, oh, yeah, great. So I wrote a show about her so wow. that I could do that. And I did that at university when I was 21. And I had a modicum of success, but not much. And then late, many, many years later, when the uh, pandemic hit and I just decided to sing some songs online for my friends to cheer them up and anyone else who might see, but really I just thought it would be my friends on Facebook, um, a couple of my mates, because I didn't start off doing Judy ones, I did Misty, or Johnny Mathis and just stuff I like. Some of my friends who'd seen the first couple texted me, go, go on, you're going to do some Judy then, go on, go on. So I was like, oh yeah, I'll get my old wig out. And did The Man That Got Away on day three. And it just, boom. I, I had 600 friends on Facebook before. And then it just started getting shared. <laughs> and, and that's it, really. And I will say, I saw Debbie in Provincetown last summer. And then recently, I saw her in Ridgefield, uh, in, uh, Ridgefield Connecticut. Connecticut, yeah. Um, you know, it's funny because I mean, going to see Debbie Wildman in concert um, is like uh, going to gym because uh, <laughs> you are up and down, up and down, up and down. I have never seen so many standing ovations at a concert in my life. Uh, and I've seen Liza in concert. I don't think Liza gets that many standing ovations mm -hmm. with all due respect to Liza. You are just amazing. And you know that I'm, you know, such a big fan of yours. And I'm, and I would say I'm your biggest fan. But so many people would uh, not <laughs> around uh, for saying that. Uh, I want to talk about the creative process and Judy. And I'm going to tie this all in. And we're going to have a little fun with each of you. Uh, I hope. Uh, and uh, we're going to have another clip of you a little later, Debbie, that will tie in with David and Tom as well. Uh, David, I want to start with you, and I want to ask you. Um, what is the one thing that you've learned about yourself uh, writing this book that you think in terms of your own creativity uh, that you think that you will take forward with all other projects that you will do after this? Well, I think that um, I would use the word sleuthing. Um, this is our third book, but our first two were compilation of interviews that we had done with Golden Age Stars. So this was really, and I don't want to, see, when I say the word academic, I don't want to say that in a negative con connotation. In other words, we do not believe our summer stock book is dry, boring, or ac academic. We think it is lively and entertaining. But I think the amount of research, as Tom talked about, that we had to do, and if you look at the acknowledgement pages, um, it's just dozens of people. And... Um, we also, I think the, what we learned is how do you take a film from 1950, which is 73 years old, and to be quite honest, it's a very white Caucasian film in 2023. So how do you contemporize it and bring it to today? That's where Savion Glover came up was an idea that Tom and I had for a forward. That's why we have Ben Vereen, and we, we, we don't want to miss out on Michael Feinstein, who was ter a tremendous assistance um, for this book, or Tommy Toon. So we brought a whole section called Taking Stock, 
in which people, Mario Cantone, another person that contributed, Marilyn Michaels, how do you take this film and look at it in today's lens? And that's what we did in the section called Taking Stock. And it's a veritable hoo-hoo of Judy fans and Gene fans. And they talk about how this film still works in 2023. Hmm. Amazing. Uh, Tom, I want to ask you, you know, in terms, uh, this is your third book together? Mm -hmm. Yes. Uh, so, Tom, what was different for you on this book, working with David? Well, you know, Dave and I go back to middle school at, uh, in Highland Park, St. Paul. Fifty years we've been working together on stuff. Uh, longer than a lot of marriages. Uh, and... Uh, <laughs> You know, uh, well, Tom, it, uh, excuse me for interrupting you, Tom. Uh, tell them what you and David used to do when you were uh, much younger in terms of reaching out to celebrities. Well, we, we got started when we were 18, and uh, the first celebrities we ever met, you know, we were newly minted high school students, uh, seniors. We were 18 years old. We reached out to Fred Astaire and Gene Kelly. And a two-year correspondence ensued where we finally, oh, snail mail back then, back in 1978, and we finally, in the summer of 1978, got the go-ahead to, to basically meet with both of them if we could get our tails out to Beverly Hills, which we did. And, uh, and that, basically, it was one photograph with Fred Astaire, an old Kodak Instamatic that we had taken that was our Willy Wonka golden ticket. To every other interview we ever did with all the with Jimmy Cagney, Lucille Ball, Gregory Peck, Frank Capra, Hoagie Carmichael, they all saw us because they said, as Jimmy Cagney had said to us, if Freddie will see you, I'll see you. So they they really opened the doors, and especially that photograph of what we took with Fred. And I do want to mention that. What was that, Debbie? Have you got it? Can we see it? You have it. Can, can I leave the Can I leave the um, camera for a second? I'll get yes, it. Yeah. And I do want to mention that today is also the anniversary of Fred Astaire's passing. Yeah. Did they go in the same day? Them, not in the same day, day, day but uh, no, no. Okay. Now, don't forget that was almost 50, 1978. Okay. This is me with Fred. Oh wow! Oh. And you look the same. And, right. and then here's Tom, here's Tom with Fred. Wow. Oh, my God. Great. And we, we bought our first suits. And people asked me, didn't you have a suit for your bar mitzvah? No, I had a sport coat. <laughs> These were our first suits. Well, Astaire deserved it. Uh, yeah, right. that's great. Thank you both for that. So, uh, Justin, I want to ask you again. This, is the, this was the 11th year, am I correct? Mm -hmm. um, what has gotten easier for you? And what has gotten tougher for you doing this uh, uh, for all these 11 years? Um, I think the, uh, oh, I don't know what, I, I don't, I think it's gotten easier certainly to get people there. Mm -hmm. That's always gotten easier mm -hmm. um, because the reputation of the show has been so successful and the mission of the show has been really successful that people know that, this is a very important charitable event for homeless LGBT kids. Um, I think the thing that gets harder for me is uh, I always, get, well, every, I kind of make fun of it now. I always get the question every time there's a roost, why does Judy Garland matter? And it gets hard for me to keep, because she does, I know, because <laughs> she does, why wouldn't she matter? I think, um, what gets harder for me is, is not harder, but I think more intense for me is that is when you talk about Judy, for me, it's always, and I, I bring this up in all my other work. Um, she left everything on the stage. Mm -hmm. She was really a performer that gave you 110%. Mm -hmm. And it's why whenever you hear those concerts of her singing, people go crazy. You know, because she was she was doing it. She was singing the songs and and giving you all that love and sadness and sorrow and hope um, for two and a half hours, all by herself. This little little woman. 
And I think that that becomes more intense as I get older, as I keep doing it, as I keep venturing into these other realms. It's like, how do you leave all that on stage? How do you become that vessel and give all that to an audience? And it's the thing that I, I hold firm with, not only with the show, but I think throughout, uh, throughout all my work, you know, on my desk, on my writing desk, I have three little pictures and one is, is a, a, a candid that somebody took of Judy Garland in concert boot. And she's just a pint of peanuts. She's just so small, but you just see this, the enormity of that kind of outreach. And, and it's, it's still inspiring. And I, I think it's the thing that keeps me coming back to it. I want to mention, uh, thank you for that, uh, that uh, Debbie has an incredible CD. Uh, it's called I'm Still Here. It's available on Amazon. Uh, and, uh, and I have it uh, downloaded and I listen to it quite often. Um, and what's wonderful about this, these are songs uh, reimagined uh, as if Judy uh, would perform them today. Um, and uh, what I love about your show, Debbie, is you come out and you've got this powerhouse voice, as we just heard, uh, singing these Judy Garland songs. And then you let your hair down, so to speak, and you're Debbie Wowman between the songs, um, commenting on Judy yourself, letting us know a little bit about yourself. Whose idea was it to do that? Was that a director's choice for you to simply be De Debbie Wildman on the uh, stage? Because I'm sure that a lot of people come to see your concerts expecting that you're going to be totally Judy on the stage, but you give them both worlds, which I think is brilliant. Yeah, it was a it was a discussion, really. We, we came... Um, so through doing stuff online, I was very lucky to get the attention of a uh, agent and manager called Scott Stander. And um, I wouldn't be going to America or anything like this without his backing and his support. Um, and uh, we talked about it together and we thought it would be a bit, I don't know. We thought it would be more interesting, something a little different to do that rather than me pretending to be her for the whole thing it's not really about that it's more about celebrating her and it's more about me doing the voice but not really embodying like I try to when singing as her but I, I'm not you know Jim Bailey had the whole the movement like completely off it's not really about that it's more about the singing mm -hmm. I do, really um and there's a nod to it obviously I'm dressed up but we just thought it would be better to be me in between and to celebrate Judy talking about her and yeah. Uh, it's incredible. Uh, I, I thought I, I thought I had a photograph here of uh, us with Brian Norber uh, at your concert recently. Uh, Judy, do you have any questions for anyone? No, I'm, I'm just you know loving how how how. Everyone here just totally embraces the, the spirit of Judy Garland, you know, who she is at her core. And, you know, as, as Justin was saying, you know, she'd leave it all on the stage. You know, it was just right there. Every emotion, every up and down and struggle and, and hope and love. And, you know, it's it's I think that's what makes her an icon. Right. Is that, you know, she was so transparently who she was. Mm. Right. And people can really relate to that. You know, they can see bits and pieces of themselves in that. So, you know, it's just really lovely the way everybody here has really captured different elements of who Garland was. Absolutely. Tom and I, Tom and I have a little bit of snobbery pride because being Minnesotans ourselves, of course, we have a little bit of an affinity for Judy. And yeah. we were just two weeks ago, um, gave a sneak peek of our book at the Judy Garland Festival in her hometown of Grand Rapids, Minnesota. So um, we love those Minnesotans. Okay. <laughs> Can I claim London? She lived here. No, there you go. Yes. Yes, Los absolutely. Angeles. Los Angeles. <laughs> So I'm going to have a little fun with you. Uh, you know, normally one of the things that I do is I do a uh, mystery question, and I'm going to see if I can make it about Judy because I don't know what the questions are. So, David, I'm going to start with you and pull a number one through four. Okay, three. And let's see if I can make this about Judy. Here we go. Uh, 
Okay, um, I'm going to make it about Judy. Uh, something that demonstrates to your friends that you are someone they can rely on. Well, the fact that you've written a book um, about, uh, you, that you've written several books uh, is something that people can rely on. Um, when, as you're writing this book, um, and you're reaching out to a lot of people, uh, and you are relying on a lot of people, and you're hoping that they're going to come back, um, what was your in your opinion, your opinion, uh, your biggest get, get uh, doing this book? That's a great question. The biggest get, um, you know, I don't want to, you know, play favorites because, you know, there was a handful of people that were instrumental. Um, fortunately, Tom and I, going back to our college days, had one-on-one -on -one interviews with Chuck Walters and Harry Warren, the principal songwriter of Summerstock, and Eddie Bracken and, and, um, and Gene Kelly. So we had primary research already and we're big believers in primary research. The challenge, of course, this is 2000 and you know, 20, we were doing research, who's alive from that film? Well, Carlton Carpenter, we were able to interview. And actually, if you remember the scene, and I know Debbie does the tractor, where the tractor is wrecked and there's those two little boys that discover the tractor. Well, one of those little boys is still alive, and we talked to him. So he's really the only cast member from from that film that's still alive. But you know, we didn't, you know, for everyone, whether it was uh, Phil Silvers, Joe Pasternak, Matt Gordon, we wanted primary research. Um, we for Matt Gordon, we went to his son. For Jeff Pass, we went to Pasternak's son. You know, we did. Uh, Stephanie Powers talked about a very interesting story about working with Phil Silvers in a. Disney film called The Boatnik. So we did a lot of digging um, to get some primary resource for people who actually knew and work with these artists. That's, that's great. Uh, so Tom, uh, same thing, pick a number one through four. One. And uh, I'm going to see if I can make it about Judy. Let's see. Um, um, this is going to be very interesting. What was one of your pet peeves writing this book? Oh, boy. Oh, that's a great <laughs> one. You have another hour? Yeah. Um, oh, boy. Oh, boy. I would say the biggest pet peeve was during the pandemic when we were doing research. It was that, you know, horrendous timing of trying to get into these archives that were basically closed for the duration. And during the pandemic, as you recall, we didn't know what the duration would be. And, mm -hmm. and it was just really frustrating because it was sort of like, well, how do we move forward on something when we need to see these files, you know, and we can't get in, you know. So that was probably the biggest frustration for me. And I know Dave kind of shares that, too, I think. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Uh, Justin, uh, number one through three. Uh, four. Uh, oh, one through three. <laughs> Two. Okay, and let's see here. It says, um, um, when putting this show together, um, how, I mean, do people, would you, people think of you as a triple giant or a tyrant? Oh, I, I'm lovely. I, I can't imagine you being I'm any lovely. Oh, I run for the mayor of nowhere. I shake everybody's hands. I help the waiters open the doors. I'm the nicest person in the world. I already know that's true. That's true. Uh, that's Debbie, right. number one or two? Uh, one, please. And let's see here. It says... Um... um do I mean uh, it say it says say no to something that you don't want to do? Um, it has something come up uh, uh, with uh, in relation to Judy Garland that you've been asked to do that you said no to. Not that I can think of. I've had people make suggestions of stuff. Basically, anything that would put her in a bad light. I don't want to do that. And also dwelling on sad things or I mean I know that there is that side to things but I like to look at the basically everyone who knew her from what I what research I've done and the people I've spoken to she wasn't a down 
person. She wasn't a tragic person. She was always very funny and always a good laugh and good company to be with, even in her rough times. So I like to concentrate on the positives and her humour and her wit and her talent. And uh, I don't want to do anything that it laughs at her, mocks her in any way, or really plays on that sort of tragic Judy trope. I'm, I'm not about it. I would... I'm a fan, first and foremost. You know, that's why I started singing her stuff is because I love it and I love her. So I I don't ever want to do anything that would take the bleep or um, portray her in anything than a fabulous shining light. Well, I applaud you for that. And there's one question left, and I'm going to give it to Judy. Uh, Judy for Judy. Um, uh, Judy... Out of all the Garland uh, performances, books, anything related to Judy, is there a favorite moment, or uh, I excluding The Wizard of Oz, of course, uh, yes. because that stands out among all others with you, uh, but is there one particular performance that you absolutely think is her greatest performance beyond that? Oh, God. Um, Maybe well, I, I love "Come On, Get Happy." Mm -hmm. Is is a, is a real a, a real favorite of mine. Um, it, it's, it's so so much of what she did was just so so incredible. It's like you know picking your favorite child, right? I know, I know. It's <laughs> you know? Well, I, I I do want to bring up this one other little thing here. Uh, I love this quote: "Fantel and Johnson have given lucky readers a fascinating, meticulously researched, mega readable book." Mega readable. I couldn't wait to watch Summerstock again. This time is a privileged insider. And that's from my neighbor, David Shire. Howdy neighbor. I'm going to go by his house the next time on my tractor and sing howdy neighbor to David Shire. So I want to thank you all for being here. Um, every year, I I've been listening to Judy all day. I do this every year on the 22nd and on the 10th. Um, I want to thank each of you for being here. I'm going to give each of you a chance to have your final word. It could be about anything that we spoke about today that you want to build upon, anything that we didn't talk about that you wish we had, or just any final word that you want to leave everyone with today. Um, I will pick you, David, after I finish speaking, and then you will pick the next person, and so on and so on. And Judy will have the final word today, almost. Because after that, I've got a very special surprise for everyone uh, from Debbie uh, that was done uh, quite some time ago uh, in celebration of summer stock. And then we're going to end with Judy having the final word today because I think that's appropriate. The other Judy having the final word. Um, I end every broadcast by telling everyone to go out and do something nice for somebody else without expecting anything in return. Call your favorite bookseller and order two copies of this book. Uh, keep one for yourself and send one to your best friend and write in the front of the book why they're your best friend. Let them know that they make a difference in your life because so much happens in our lives and we want to tell people after the fact. And I think it's important that we do so while they're here to enjoy it. So let's all do that. Uh, pick up the phone and call someone you haven't spoken to in a while. Not an email message, not a text message, not a private inbox message, but a phone call and let that person know that they have made a true difference in your life. I have a dear friend, he says, we're all in the same storm but we're in different size boats. And I always say, I don't care what size boat you're on as long as you have a skipper by your side. And with that, I'm gonna leave the screen and David Fantel, it's always yours. And that my friend is true entertainment. It's yours. Thanks Richard and thanks everyone uh, for participating. You know, I just think after this book and certainly my interest in this genre for 50 years is that Judy, was really the heart and soul of the golden age of the MGM musical. And when she departed in 1950, yes, there were still some really excellent films made at MGM musicals, The Bandwagon, Singing in the Rain, but you really did not have that triple threat that Judy possessed. And yes, you added Jane Powell, um, but you or you may add a Vera Allen or a Sid Charisse. Some of them had to be dubbed because they couldn't sing. Most of them certainly couldn't act like Judy, but Judy could do it all. And that's why I really think, and I've learned through the years, that she defined the MGM musical. And I get, I better, um, in fear of um, our 50-year relationship, I'll go to Tom. Mm -hmm. 
<laughs> Thank you, David. Um, you know, when I when I think of Judy and watch her on screen, I always think of chutzpah and what Gene Kelly said. Uh, you know, which we quote in the book. She was his favorite singer, his favorite performer. She could do everything well. She was amazing. She, he would teach her a complicated dance step, he told us, and she would have it within a, like a minute. She would have it all down half. She was just an amazing, probably once in a lifetime or a century talent. And uh, I just feel privileged to, you know, have been able to watch her perform and listen to her uh, records. And uh, I wish I could have seen her live. I, uh, not that old. I'm pretty old, but not that old. So, uh, say la vie. And with that, I, I give it over to Debbie. Oh, thank you. Um, well, thank you for having me on. And uh, weirdly enough, when Richard was talking at the beginning about his reaction to Judy Garland's passing, I thought, oh, God, that's so similar to my reaction to Fred Astaire's passing. And then he said it was the same day. But many years later, which surprised me, I didn't know it was the same day. I heard that Fred had died and I was, I think, three or four. But because I'd been watching his films with my grandmother for years, I knew very well who he was. I burst into tears, crying my eyes out, and then said rather dramatically to my grandmother, all my heroes are dead <laughs> at three. <laughs> and so uh, I thought, oh, yeah, that's yeah and uh a final thought for like judy's last period when she was in london i know it's obviously very sad but what i like is if you look at all the pictures of her in that period with mickey deans you know with their marriage they got married in the march and she died in the june she looks so happy i know she's very slim i know she's not well but my goodness she is like the cat that got the cream i was looking at pictures of her today of those you know last few months she's really happy and i think that's a really good way to think about it you know yeah she did pass away and she was very young and it's very sad but she was you see her when he's got her arm around her and she's like <laughs> look at him she's she's having a good time and I like to think of that you know she was hanging with cool 1960s bands in London like the pretty things and partying at nightclubs and um you know if you're gonna go go when you're having a great time and you're in love and yeah yeah that's what you're happy Judy's, <laughs> Judy's last June um and with that I'd like to pass over to Justin please uh, well, thank you. I mean, uh, bringing up the rear, but I'm happy to do it. Uh, I think, you know, if especially being pride, I think, think of the ways in which you can share parts of yourself. Mm -hmm. you know, the, the continual thing that everyone's talked about is how Judy Garland touched people's lives. And I think that's really how we find immortality is, is the people that we touch, is the ways in which we give to one another. And I think, especially during this month, we're so we're kind of thinking about, you know, pride in, in, a, in a context. I think it's all about how we can kind of perpetuate a sense of giving to one another. And uh, I'm very proud to do that in the name of Judy Garland and very proud to do it today. Thank you, Justin. Thanks. Good luck with the show. And think about the people that inspire you in your life. Who are your idols? Who are the, the people that make you go, oh, wow, that person is really just amazing. What can you learn from that person? What, what's your takeaway that you can bring into your own life? I think that's really the crux of what we were talking about today. So pursue your idols, pursue your, your inspiration but mostly pursue what they mean to you. And someone who means a lot to me is Richard Skipper. Oh, hello. And welcome to a song today. Orville's father has given me this wonderful tractor, but I'm gonna pay for it. And I'll work my debts off, too, or I'm not a Falbury. But not today. I'm not going to work today. 
Today is my birthday. <laughs> so, uh, well, I'm just gonna have fun driving this wonderful tractor. Howdy, neighbor! Howdy. Howdy neighbor, happy harvest, may your 40 acres soon be fields of clover, yes indeed and plant a wish with every seed and by and by the sun and rain will make an etching of a million little green fingers stretching to the sky. Howdy neighbor, happy harvest. Get your rocking chairs, for all your cares are over. Clap your hands and lick your chops, your bumper crops are on the climb. Hey, we're gonna roll in plenty, spend a five or ten or twenty, and those happy harvest bells are gonna chime. Remember, neighbor, when you work for Mother Nature, you get paid by Father Tom. Chicks are gonna cackle, and every burlap sack will be full of taters and tobaccos, and dozens of different good and healthy greens. And if the weatherman won't upset us, mister, you can bet us there'll be lots of crispy lettuce in your jeans. Give in to life and find out just what living means. Neighbor, happy harvest. May your 40 acres soon be fields of clover. Go on, pop your corncob pipes and no more gripes and no more groans. No mortgages or loans and you won't see a trace of worrying on the face of Farmer Jones. Howdy, neighbor. Howdy, neighbor. Howdy, harvest. Chops, your bumper crops are on the climb. Hey, we're gonna roll in plenty. Spend a five or ten or twenty. And those happy harvest bells are gonna chime. Remember, neighbor, when you work for Mother Nature, you get paid by Father Ladies and gentlemen, what can you say? The great Judy Garland. Yeah! No one else. 
Oh! 